Thanks, Alvin. Sure. All right. Uh, so today, you know, as the topic describes, we're going to talk about energy efficient deep learning challenges and opportunities. Um, in particular, the way that the, this talk is kind of structured is more of an overview of the whole area. I will kind of put in some of, you know, the key uh, new pieces of technology that people have been developing over the past few years to address some of the challenges in this space. But uh, I, guess I would say that the first part of this talk is more of a tutorial-like nature, and then the second is more technology type of thing, uh, type based. Um, I think one of the goals of this kind of talk is also to help kind of organize a lot of the technology that's currently out there. Um, as Alvin mentioned, it's a very hot space, and I think one of the really critical aspects that when there's a very hot space is to learn, you know, what are the different types of things that are out there, but how to evaluate the technology that's coming out, um, whether or not it has high impact or not. So towards the end of the talk, I'm actually going to spend some uh, minutes talking about benchmarking and how to evaluate and compare different designs. And I think that might be uh, hopefully very useful to this community in terms of assessing all the new and upcoming papers. Because in particular in this space, you get new papers like 20, 30 papers on archive a day in this both the algorithms and the hardware, so it's a very active space. Uh, before I start, I also should acknowledge uh, my collaborators in this space, in particular my students Yushin Chen and Jianru Yang, and then my collaborator Joel Emmer. Uh, they contribute to a lot of the work that appears in today's slides. Um, so to start off with, we know that you know, deep learning is very prevalent in a wide range of applications, beginning with things like computer vision and speech recognition that's widely used today. Um, and then also uh, for things like gameplay, so there was a lot of press that happened uh, back in the early 2016 looking at um, whether or not uh, deep learning can be used to you know, overcome one of the grand AI challenges, which is playing the game of Go. And yes, in fact, it did do that. The reason why Go is considered very challenging is that the number of uh, possible moves is more than the number of atoms in the universe, so you can't do a brute force search. Um, but they were able to show that deep learning, in fact, is um, able to beat the world champion at the game of Go. That happened, I think, back in March 2016. Um, and then more recently, people are looking at some emerging applications like uh, uh, medical diagnostics uh, for medical imaging, um, as well as other types of things like genomic sequencing and so on. Um, so there's a wide range of applications. Um, so very briefly, I'm going to talk about what exactly is deep learning. This is a very high level, but just to give you an intuition, more focused on what is the actual processing that's going on, because as hardware designers, that's what we actually care about. But just to give you ideas, an idea of what it's actually doing, well, effectively what deep learning is doing is that you is basically take in, for example, an image classification task. It allows you to take in an image, and then you can label what that actual image is. And the idea in terms of deep learning is that you have these layers of neurons and synapses, or you can think of it just layers of um, weights and some computation of the weights on the image. Um, and these layers of processing, let's call it that, um, will extract different levels of features from the data, right? So starting off from the very uh, earlier on part of the network, you might be trying to extract low level features like edges, for example, because you can imagine edges are very meaningful in terms of um, looking at image processing. And then as you go deeper and deeper into the network, you might get higher and higher level features. Um, so for example, if you're looking at a car, you might start to get some wheels and then maybe even different sides of the cars and so on. And finally, you're able to classify it. Um, as an actual, uh, for example, a Volvo in this particular case, and even a, a particular make of the Volvo. Um, the, the thing that makes deep learning really stand out is the way that you can extract these features, the, the weights that you would use to apply you know, this layer of computation on the images are actually learned from the data itself. Historically, if you look at uh, computer vision before, uh, you know, kind of deep learn, the rise of deep learning in 2012, really the way by which people would do it is that you'd have an expert in computer vision say, hey, I'm looking at this image, what's really important is not edges. But now you can actually discover these types of features with the, uh, through the data itself. Um, and effectively, at each of these layers um, that are shown here, all you're really actually doing is nothing very special, actually. It's just you have a bunch of input values. We could call it the input layers. You multiply it by a series of weights, and you generate another you know, output set of values of data. And so effectively, all you're really doing in the, this, on each layer is doing just a weighted sum. Right? So you have a bunch of inputs. You do a weighted sum of the inputs. Um, and then you pass it through some nonlinear activation function that allows you to represent a more diverse set of functions. And then that's it. You just keep on repeating this. And effectively, what you're actually doing when you're training is that you're learning the weights based on data. And it's a very simple um, implementation, actually. 
Um, and so why is deep learning hot now? So the, the concept of neural nets and using that type of processing has been around for decades. Uh, the reason why it's really taken off is kind of the intersection of three key effects, primarily the first two. First is the availability of big data. Right? So just taking some examples, if you look at, for instance, Facebook, actually this is kind of old, but Facebook historically, maybe a couple of years ago, had 350 million images uploaded per day, but this number actually has increased significantly. In fact, they are now very uh, video-based as well. Um, you have Walmart having 2.5 petabytes of cu uh, customer data, data hourly, and then YouTube have th has 300 hours of video uploaded every minute. Again, this is, I think, the YouTube statistics from 2013, so you can imagine the growth is much higher now. Uh, so there's a huge amount of data, um, and then also there's a huge amount of processing that's available now. And this is where really, as hardware designers, we can really play a role. So, um, you know, there's a quote from one of the luminaries in the space who are basically saying that they consider compute basically the oxygen of deep learning. So you really need to have a lot of really powerful computation to kind of crunch through all of this data to extract the meaningful information to train these networks. So the availability of GPUs really helped this space take off. And of course, there are a couple of new machine learning techniques. But really, you know, what really drove it you know, in terms of timing was the availability of data and the GPU acceleration. Um, so let's briefly talk about you know, what are kind of the key steps in deep learning itself. In particular, we're going to focus on deep convolutional neural nets, um, which are primarily used to process images, although these days they also show that you can actually process speech and sequences with them as well. Um, and some of the ideas that um, we're going to talk about with respect to convolutional neural nets also extend to other types of neural nets as well. But we'll just start with this because it tends to be more widely used and easier to understand. Um, so when we're talking about deep neural nets, uh, one thing to really highlight between the difference between deep neural nets today versus you know, two, three decades ago when we we're talking about neural nets is that the number of layers that you have can be much more. Right? So in some cases, we are talking about up to 1,000 a thousand convolutional layers. And I'll talk later about what an actual convolutional layer is. And again, as you go deeper and deeper into the network, you can go from these low-level features to high-level features. You can represent more and more high-level um, information. And then typically, for an image classification task, uh, convolutional layers are going to be followed by a fully connected layer, one to three fully connected layer, to reduce it to some class information. Um, as a hardware designer, what you should take away is the fact that the convolutions um, account for more than 90% of the overall computation. So they really dominate both the runtime and the energy consumption of processing these neural nets. Um, so let's take a look as to why this actual convolutional aspect is so expensive. Um, particularly if you've done some work before on image processing, you know that doing a 2D image convolution is you know, no big deal. We've been doing that for decades as well. So why is it actually um, so challenging for neural nets? So let's start with a very basic example of if I have a 2D image or a 2D feature map. So an image would be at the very beginning of the neural net, and a feature map would be you know, the um, intermediate data that you might have, uh, for instance, over here. Um, and then we apply a 2D filter to it. Um, basically, what you would do to apply a 2D filter is you would do an element-wise multiplication between each of the filter weights and each of the pixels or each of the activations of the feature map. You'd sum up those partial sum values, those products of those values, and you generate a pixel. Um, and then, you know, in terms of convolution, you would slide this filter across the entire image, and this is just regular 2D convolution, as I said. This has you know, been happening for decades, nothing special. And you would be able to generate other pixels. So what makes a CNN actually quite complicated is the dimensionality. So first of all, um, we're not just doing 2D convolutions, but you, first of all, you have a third dimension, um, which we refer to as uh, channels. So, for example, looking at the uh, winning neural network from 2012 that really pushed this whole trend, AlexNet, we're talking about 3 to 192 channels. And what these channels are is that basically you're doing a 2D convolution at each of the channels, and then you're adding it together to generate one output value. Right? But the, if the channels are quite large, from 3 to 192, you can imagine that the amount of computation is significantly already, in this particular case, two orders of magnitude higher than just a 2D convolution. Uh, to give you some intuition in terms of what these channels actually mean, if we're talking about an input image, for example, you would have three channels, R, G, and B, for example. Those would be the common channels that are used for the input. In addition to this, what we'd also do is that we'd actually apply multiple filters to the same image as well. Right? And then each of these filters, when you do this convolution with an input image, would generate, each of them would generate one output channel. So as a result, when you have M input filters, 
your output would be M output channels. Okay? And then again, the number of filters that you have can be quite large. So using AlexNet, um, again, as an example, we're looking at 96 to 384 filters that you're applying to the same input image. Um, finally, usually in a lot of applications, you're not just processing one particular image. You might want to repeat this processing on multiple images. Um, and so what we typically refer to that is a batch size in terms of number of images. And if you have you know, n input images, you'll be able to generate n output images based on that. Um, so the one notable thing that really stands out for these modern neural nets is that they have very large size and the size varies significantly. So for example, if we take AlexNet as um, a driving example here, if we look at just layer ones, two, and three, for instance, if we look at the number of parameters that you have for the uh, filters themselves, we're talking about you know, tens of thousands to hundreds of thousands of weight parameters. These are just the weights of the filter. This is not including the actual image data that you're sending through the system. Um, and then also in terms of the number of operations that you actually have to do, you're talking about hundreds of millions of Macs per layer. So a Mac is a multiply and accumulate per layer. And this is for an input image that's around 224 by 224 pixels. Right? And these days, of course, we're dealing with HD, Ultra HD, and even larger. Right? So this is quite substantial amount of processing for very little data. So the, you know, the, the complexity of the computation and the storage cost per layer is quite high. Uh, furthermore, as you look across layers, the filter shapes also change, right? So for example, in layer one, we're looking at a one by one, uh, sorry, 11 by 11 filter size, um, you know, a 96 number of filters and three channels. And then layer two, then the filter size changes to five by five and then different number of filters and a different number of channels and so on. Um, in some recent work, you know, uh, they have kind of tried to make all the filter sizes the same, but the number of filters and number of channels still vary. And why is this important? Well, as hardware designers, we know that the more that you can actually hard code, the more efficient the system can actually be. However, if you want to be able to support a variety of neural nets or even a single neural net with varying number of layers, you're going to have to build in that flexibility into your hardware to be able to do this. Right? So this kind of configurability is a very important feature um, for designing, designing neural network processors. Um, so as I mentioned, over the past few years, there's been a huge amount of activity in this area. Actually, the first convolutional neural net um, was designed back in the 90s by Jan LeCun doing digit classification. And then since then, um, in this image, uh, net rec uh, image net challenge that was started in Fei-Fei Li's group at Stanford, where basically they give you one image and you have to classify it into one of a thousand categories. Um, you know, they had a reasonable error performance prior to this, and then there was a huge kind of drop in error, so the lower the better here, starting with AlexNet. This is some work by Alex Koresky from Jeff Hinton's group back in University of Toronto in 2012, and they were kind of the first team to use uh, CNNs in this ImageNet challenge. And then since then, you can see, you know, the progression of the error has increasingly reduced over the years, looking at, you know, with new techniques like, uh, that's what was introduced with, you know, uh, VGG, GoogleNet, and ResNet. So in fact, in ResNet in 2015, they actually beat human level accuracy, as shown here. Um, again, it's always important to point out that this human is one grad student at Stanford representing all of mankind. But um, nonetheless, it's good to know as a benchmark in terms of how impressive it actually is. And really, this is the reason why it's taken off in industry, right? Because you're actually getting very impressive accuracy results out of it. And as hardware designers, I want you guys to keep this in mind, right? So, you know, often we will have to make some trade-offs in order to make the system more energy efficient or faster. But fundamentally, you don't want to trade off too much of the accuracy because this is why people are so excited about this particular space and this particular uh, um, set of algorithms or technology. Um, just another quick summary in terms of the types of CNNs that are out there. Again, in the previous chart, we were just showing the accuracy, but let's take a deeper look. So the, to the top five error, and that basically means that, as I mentioned, this ImageNet challenge, you have to classify into one of a thousand categories. Typically, you give scores to all these categories. And if you know, the correct co category is in one of your top five scores, it's considered correct. So that's what this metric means. And so you can see that Linet was on digit classification, so it doesn't apply here. But then um, since Alec, Net, all the way down to ResNet, the error has really dropped. I believe the uh, winner from last year had a result about 2 point something percent, 2.7 percent. So it's continued to reduce then. Uh, you can see, as I mentioned, the input size for these particular competitions, the image size is actually quite small. We're talking about around 200 by 200 pixels. Um, 
One important trend that I want you guys to notice is that the convolutional layers are continuing to increase. Right? So we spent a lot of time just discussing what a convolutional layer is, and the trend in this space is that they're increasing. They tend to go deeper. Um, and at the same time, these fully connected layers, and just to give you guys, I didn't spend too much time on that, but what a fully connected layer is, is actually you can think of it as when your input feature map is the same size as your filter. So it's a one-to-one -one correspondence between a weight and an activation. So meaning there's no sliding effect or no convolution effect, so no data reuse there. Um, so as a result, uh, that tends to be actually quite challenging. So back in AlexNet, you'd have, you know, uh, basically almost majority of the weights. So if you look at the number of weights in um, AlexNet for fully connected layer versus convolutional layer, majority of the weights were in the fully connected layer. But since then, people realized this issue, so they've designed their networks to really reduce the number of fully connected layers. And so as a result, now you can see the predominant effect is really most of the computation and most of the storage lies in the actual uh, convolutional layers. And again, I really want to emphasize that you know, the number of channels, the number of filters, and the filter size will continue to vary from layer to layer. So that flexibility is really important in terms of designing hardware. Um, so as I mentioned, this area, you know, things keep on changing. But one trend that has been arising is that convolutional layers are becoming increasingly important. Um, another thing to really just point out in this particular space is there's actually kind of two uh, phases when we're talking about deep learning. There's the training aspect, which is when I take you know, this large set of data, and based on this large set of data, set of data typically this is labeled data. So it, the success stories that are usually used for deep learning so far have been the cases where uh, they do what we call supervised learning. So someone has gone in and labeled all of the data. It's very cleanly labeled. Um, so based on this large labeled data set, um, they've been able to determine what the weights actually are in the neural network. Okay, so that's during the training phase. This typically happens in the cloud, just based on the fact that you have a lot of data in the cloud and you have a lot of uh, power and access to that. And then what would typically happen is once you've determined what the weights actually are of the neural network after this training, you could download it onto an edge device, for example, your phone or a drone or even a car. And there what you're actually doing is you're using the weights. So you're applying the convolutions that we actually just talked about, as opposed to trying to figure out what those weights are. Uh, I won't spend too much time on training in today's talk, but actually a large core component of the training is also performing convolution. So some of the techniques that we described today do map back to the training itself. Okay. Um, and again, one of the things I really want to emphasize is actually the inference part. You could do it on an edge device or you can do it in the cloud, but there are obvious advantages of doing it on an edge device. So for instance, privacy and security these days. So um, a lot of things these days, maybe you don't want to share all of your information with the cloud because it might not be so secure. Um, so ideally, you'd like to keep all of your data, let's say, on your device. Um, so if you can do the processing at the edge, that would be very nice. Um, another reason why you might want to do edge processing as opposed to uh, in the cloud processing would be latency. So if you're doing any interactions with the real world, for example, self-driving cars, if you're doing navigation with drones, you might not be able to afford the time it actually takes to send the data to the cloud and for the data, the response to actually come back, right? Especially if you're going very fast. So latency is also a very stringent requirement um, to motivate edge processing. Um, and then also communication. So sometimes you just don't have enough bandwidth to actually send um, your stuff to the cloud. Or if you're thinking about the space of, kind of, let's say, Internet of Things, if you have too many items that are actually talking at the same time, they might interfere with each other and limit the bandwidth or limit... Um, the ability to communicate. So all in all, you know, all of these things really push um, the need to process at the edge. Uh, but of course, at the edge, you also have various different challenges, right? So um, okay, just very briefly, maybe this will be out of order, but very briefly, the, the main challenge you would have is at the edge. The edge would be the energy consumption. Um, and that's actually one of the main drivers of the research within my group. Um, but before I get to the energy consumption, I also want to walk through some of the challenges that lie in designing systems for deep learning. Um, and I think it's really important to be able to assess different systems across all of these different metrics. So I'm going to spend some time here going through these metrics, and then I will talk about them again in a different context at the end of this talk. So the first thing that's very important is actually the accuracy. So as I mentioned, the reason why people are very excited about this space is the accuracy that it's actually achieving, right? Um, there's a lot of data sets that exist out there that enable you to, like these are publicly available data sets, allow you to train your neural net and then also test the accuracy of your neural net. 
Um, so some of these data sets are things like MNIST, which is a digit rec uh, recognition task, and this was actually available in the 80s. And then there's the ImageNet data set that was designed by Fei-Fei Li's group from the ImageNet Challenge, and this was uh, made more available in the 2010-ish uh, or 2009 era. I would want to emphasize that the scope or the difficulty of these two particular data sets is obviously very different. Right, so doing an image classification of one to, out of a thousand, you know, one image in a thousand classes is a much more challenging task than doing digit classification. Digit classification is something, in fact, that's already been quite successful and quite widely deployed uh, back in the 90s in terms of things like recognizing zip codes for the mail or in the ATM machine. Um, the image that challenge is what really people were very excited about. And in particular, on the ImageNet challenge, you can do tasks like object classification, which I, or image classification, which I give you an image and you tell me you know, what's in the image, but you only have one label. Um, and now, since they've already beat human level accuracy, they've moved on to things like object detection, where not only do you have to tell me you know, what is the object in the image, but also where is the object in the image. And that becomes a more difficult task. OK, so in terms of accuracy, um, again, it's not sufficient that people just tell you a given percentage. You should ask them, you know, on what task it actually is. Is it digit classification, image classification, object detection, activity recognition, right? These are all increasingly more difficult tasks. You should ask on what data set it's actually been run on. So I think this is, this is very important in terms of assessing the hardware, because typically what you're going to get is someone's going to give you a piece of hardware and say, I'm going to be able to do this task. You should ask them what exactly is the task that you're doing. Um, another thing is program programmability is also really important. So we've seen that neural nets or deep learning is very widely used in a wide range of applications. And so you need to have some flexibility in the net network, not only to support layer to by layer, but you also want to be able to support different weights and maybe different types of neural nets and configurations. Um, then we move on to kind of energy and power. So if you're looking at um, an edge device, um, energy is really critical because of the battery capacity. Right, so you have only limited battery life that you want to extend uh, the battery life. Um, if you're working in the cloud, actually power is still very important due to the heat dissipation. Right? So the amount of processing you can actually do is limited by the amount of um, heat that it's generating or the amount of cooling costs that you can spend on cooling down that system. When we're looking at energy, it's really important to look at the energy of the whole or power of the whole system. So you can look at the energy per operation of the chip itself, but you should also consider um, system level types of power consumption, things like DRAM. Uh, for a lot of applications, we care about things like throughput or latency, right? So for example, if I'm doing analytics, uh, in the cloud, I want to be able to run very, you know, very quickly through a lot of data. If I'm looking at video, maybe I want to do 30 frames per second. Um, but then also you have latency for, again, real-time applications. So if you're doing you know, self-driving car, um, navigation, or even interactive um, type of applications, the delay is also really important. Um, and as it turns out, these things are, you know, often they're lumped together, but actually they're quite different. Um, a very typical way by which people might achieve you know, high throughput is you bundle a lot of data together and you run through that data. That's called like batching a lot of data. And that might be very effective for high throughput, but you might not be able to afford to do that with low latency applications. And then finally, of course, it's really important to assess the cost of a given solution. So in terms of, for instance, how much memory the person's actually, the design's actually using, the number of cores, and so on. So I just want you guys to kind of keep this in mind when you're evaluating a lot of these systems that come out in the future. It's not just one number. It's not just a tops per watt. It's not just the accuracy. But really, there's a whole set of metrics that you should really um, you know, take into account. And these are actually the, one of the main challenges in the deep learning space is to kind of balance all of these different metrics. Um, so now I'm going to talk a little bit um, from a technical standpoint. What are the things that people are actually doing to try and address these challenges? Um, so we're going to start from the architecture level. Um, so as we know already, there's a huge number of existing CPUs and GPUs that have been um, developed that are out there that are targeting deep learning. Um, so for example, Intel has their Knight's Landing um, offering, and now they also have their Knight's Mills. Um, NVIDIA has their Pascal offering, and now this was actually, this is a little old now, it's GPU 100, but now they have their V100 and so on. They all continue to improve their offerings, really targeting uh, deep learning. Um, typically, in all of these uh, type of platforms, what they're really exploiting is the use of matrix multiplication to accelerate, oh, the, the use of matrix multiplication libraries to accelerate um, the processing uh, for these uh, neural nets on the CPUs and GPUs. 
Um, so I'm just going to just briefly walk through in terms of how we actually translate you know, that convolution that we just saw before into a matrix multiplication. Right? So for example, if I'm doing, uh, if I have a 3 by 3 input image, and I want to convolve it with a 2 by 2 filter, you know, basically you would slide this 2 by 2 over this, and you would generate a 2 by 2 output. And effectively, in order to turn this into a matrix multiplication, what you would actually do is you would take this 2D filter, for example, and then extend it into a 1D uh, value. So you could just basically kind of scan through it and wrap it. Um, and then for your input feature map, what you would actually do is you would do a toplets matrix. And it's basically an expansion of this infer feature map. Um, so that basically when you're doing basically this one row of filters, and when you multiply it by one column, of this new topless matrix expanded feature map, you're effectively doing this you know, element-wise multiplication that we talked about before. And then you generate you know, one point in the output. And then you would repeat this kind of matrix multiplication and generate all the outputs as well. Um, one of the downsides of this, of course, is that you'll notice in the topless matrix is that there's a lot of uh, redundant or repeated data. And that's necessary in order to just basically map this onto the matrix multiplication framework. Uh, but the reason you want to do this is, again, there already exists a lot of infrastructure in the CPU and GPU domain that is very you know, focused on accelerating matrix multiplication. So here, this is an instance of I'm taking you know, a problem that I have and trying to utilize some techniques or some infrastructure that already exists. And this is one effective way of doing it. So taking my convolutions, translating them into a matrix multiplication, and then performing this uh, matrix multiplication on the CPU and GPU. And so the way by which they tend to focus on accelerating this is that they look at different ways by which we can actually reduce the number of operations to increase the throughput of performing this matrix multiplication. OK, so we'll walk through a couple of examples. Um, so actually, I'll just listen there. So one very, if you're you know, kind of familiar with convolutions or matrix multiplication, one very effective way of doing this would be the fast Fourier transform. Right? So if you recall from your signal processing classes, maybe you know, a convolution in space is a matrix multiplication of you know, uh, the Fourier transform um, in, in the frequency domain. And so this enables you to translate basically um, a direct convolution um, that might be you know, O to the n to the fourth into basically O squared log O. Um, the drawback of this is that it really increases storage requirements. And then you can also see a lot of the gains here depends on uh, both the size of the output feature map and the filter itself. Um, so one of the challenges here is that typically your filter is much smaller than your output feature map. And so you'll have to zero pad your filter in order to make it the same size. And so there's some overhead there. Um, some other work that people have looked at in terms of really accelerating matrix multiplication in the past has been the Strassen um, algorithm. And this is really effective, particularly if you have um, very large matrices. So if you look at the O notation again, you're going from O n to the cube to O n to the 2.07. Uh, so you can imagine as, as n grows, this becomes an effective way of reducing um, uh, the amount of computation that you actually do. I, I should emphasize that for all of these, basically, except for numerical stability, you know, you get the identical input. From the identical inputs, you get the identical outputs. Um, one really actually um, uh, popular way of doing it actually now is Winograd. Um, and the idea here is, again, I will go through an example of this, but it's another transform that you can do that basically uh, for, for example, a 3 by 3 filter, you can reduce the number of multiplications by 2.25x. So you get a speed up there. Uh, the real challenge here, of course, is that you're going to have specialized processing depending on the filter size itself. So it's not that you have one Winograd transform for all filter sizes, for all, but for all the, each different filter size, you have different transforms. So um, you can imagine software might be OK, write a kernel for that, and hardware might be a little bit more challenging because you have to design different hardware for that. To give you guys an idea in terms of what's actually going on with these transforms, I'm going to just use the uh, analogy with Gauss's multiplication algorithm. So imagine if you're multiplying this complex variable with you know, both real and imaginary parts with each other, you would generate this particular output. So here, you're looking at four multiplications and then three you know, additions or subtractions, right? equivalently. Um, but what you could do is that you could reassociate the data in a different way. Right? So for example, you can pre-compute these intermediate values, k1, k2, k3. Um, and here, as a result, and then you can compute the real parts and the imaginary parts of this value. And as a result of doing this reassociation or you know, pre-computation, you can actually reduce the number of multiplications from four to three. Um, often this does cut at a cost of increasing the number of additions. 
But really, since um, typically on these platforms, the number of multiplications drives the throughput, um, you, get, you get a gain from this. And so all those other transforms that we talk about are some basic variation of this, trying to re basically reassociate the data so you're reducing the number of uh, multiplications that you actually do. Um, OK, so that's kind of very high level in terms of what's actually going typically on these um, CPUs and GPUs, and in fact, you know, when they're releasing new software, like new versions of CUDNN, for for example, for NVIDIA, this is you know one of the algorithms that you know they've introduced as part of the algorithm to give you more acceleration on their particular platforms. Just trying to figure out different ways to really reduce the number of operations. Um, so that's what you can do for today's existing hardware. Um, but as we know, there's also been an increase in terms of the amount of specialized hardware or accelerators that have been out there for uh, deep neural nets. So we'll briefly kind of walk through um, some, of, some examples of what's going on in the um, accelerator space. Um, so if you think back again, this whole entire process is just a bunch of multiplies and accumulates. Um, and so what's really great about it is that high parallelism is actually possible. Right? So you can do all these max all at the same time. So you can actually achieve high throughput. That should be no issue. But the main challenge actually lies in the memory access. So how do you actually deliver the data to the multiply and accumulate engine to perform this operation? Right? So let's look at it in two different ways. The first is that for every multiply and accumulate that I actually have to do, I need to access three pieces of input data. So I have to do three memory reads, one for the filter weight, one for the image pixel, and one for the partial sum. And then I'm going to do one write to memory, which would be the updated partial sum. So it's already a 4 to 1 ratio in terms of memory access versus compute. The second issue is that the energy cost for memory access often is much higher than the compute itself. So just to give you an example of the very worst case scenario, so you would never really do this, but just give you the gravity of what it could be, is that if I read and wrote everything, if all my app memory accesses were from, directly from the DRAM, um, and access to the DRAM is often two orders of magnitude higher in energy than the actual multiply and accumulate itself. So you're talking about a 4 to 1 ratio in terms of number of memory accesses and a com on computation, and then you're talking about two orders of magnitude per memory access in terms of energy versus compute. Right? So for example, if we take AlexNet as another example, um, if we had you know, 700 million max, we're talking about 3 billion DRAM accesses, and each of these accesses would be you know, two orders of magnitude more expensive than each of those multiplies and accumulates. So you can see that memory really is the bottleneck, both in terms of performance and especially in terms of energy. Um, however, there are some things that you can do to reduce this memory access cost. So what typically happens in a lot of computer architectures is that you want to read this memory into your chip and read it into a low-cost memory and try and reuse it multiple times from this low-cost memory, meaning I want to reread the same data you know, multiple times from a very low-cost thing and not re-access it from the off-chip memory or the DRAM. Um, and as it turns out, there's many opportunities in convolutional networks to do uh, this type of data reuse. Uh, so the first type of reuse that can be exploited is convolutional reuse. And the idea here is if you think through the convolution itself, we're actually using the same type of data, the weights and the activations or the weights and the pixels, just we're just combining them in different order. Right? So there's an opportunity to reuse both the pixel information and the weights information. Um, and if you can also remember, we also like to apply multiple filters to the same image itself. So I like to generate multiple output channels. Um, and so as a result, any you know, pixel that you read onto the chip, you could potentially reuse multiple times across the different filters. And then finally, for a lot of applications, you actually want to batch and do multiple image, images or process multiple images together at the same time. And so as a result, in those particular cases, one particular filter weight that you read onto the chip, you can reuse it. And into the low-cost memory, you could reuse it multiple times across the different images. Right? So there's these three forms of reuse that we can really exploit um, to minimize the amount of data that we need to fetch from a more expensive memory. Um, another thing that I want to point out is in terms of the actual uh, architectures that you might use to actually design this parallel processing, um, there's actually two kind of loose categories that we would use in this particular space. One is shown into the, on the left, what we call a temporal architecture. And the main idea here is that you'd have a bunch of ALUs. These are basically units that are doing the multiplies and accumulates. They would share the same control. 
um, and they would share the same register file. Um, and so this is typically what you'd find if you're using SIMD in a CPU or SIMT in a GPU. An alternative architecture that you could use is what we would call a spatial architecture. Um, and this is what doing what we would call more kind of data flow processing. And the idea is that we would distribute the control and the register file or the storage across all of the different ALUs. So they'd each have their own control and their own memory. Right? So the benefit of having their own memory is that basically, and we're talking a very small memory here, about 0.5 to 1 k bytes of memory. Uh, the benefit of having that is, first of all, the memory is closer, so it, you know, it travels less. And if you travel less, you have to switch less capacitance, and then um, you know, it consumes less energy. And also, we know that smaller memories also themselves tend to consume less energy as well. Right? So having these small memories locally near the processing it can be very beneficial in terms of energy access. Um, and then furthermore, they have their own control, and they also are able to communicate amongst the different PEs. We're going to call basically the combination of an ALU, a register file, and control, a processing element, or a PE. And so these PEs, or processing elements, can really share data. There's allowed for communication between the processing elements. They don't have to go through the expensive kind of memory hierarchy to pass data back and forth. And so it allows you to basically read data from local storage or from your neighbor, and that tends to be much cheaper in terms of energy uh, than reading it from the memory hierarchy. So once you have this type of spatial architecture, the question you might ask is, now how do I take this very large neural network that we talked about with you know, millions of parameters and then map it onto this spatial architecture so we can really increase the reuse of the input data, primarily the weights and the uh, pixels, and as well as trying to do as much accumulation of this partial sum information as possible. So I really want to just highlight often um, in this space, people really focus on the input data, so the pixels, or if you're looking at feature maps, the activations, and then the weights. But one thing also to consider is that there's this intermediate data, this partial sum that happens during this computation, because sometimes the filters are so large that you can't accumulate all the values all in one place. So you might have to have some intermediate partial sum data that, you, that hangs around and you need to sort somewhere. Right? So also managing and trying to figure out where that would be stored and what the data movement of the partial sums is also very important. Okay? And so the real challenge here now is that I want to be able to balance increasing the amount of reuse of weights and pixels, as well as doing as much local partial sum accumulation as possible. And the problem is, if you kind of think through this problem, is that you can't group all three together. Typically, there's going to be a trade-off. If I group you know, maximize reuse in one dimension, I'm going to pay in kind of spreading the data in the other dimension. Um, so that's really the challenge in this space. Um, and so we've been looking within our group at the various different ways that you can do these uh, t different types of data flow. Again, trying to think of how we take this large neural net and map it onto this uh, spatial architecture. In particular, because I mentioned that the storage of the spatial architecture is very low. For each of these PE, we're talking about 1K byte of memory, but then you're talking about millions of parameters. So how do you do that mapping? Um, and again, one of the things that are driving the mapping, just to reemphasize it so you guys don't forget, is that you know, data movement is very expensive. So for instance, this is in a 65 nanometer technology, it's just an example. If I do multiply and accumulate, if it's 1x, reading from a register file, that's around 1k bytes or less, is also 1x. Reading from my neighbor might be 2x in terms of the energy. Uh, reading from a global buffer that's, let's say, between 100k bytes or 500k bytes would be 6x the energy. And then going to the DRAM would be, of course, the most expensive at 200. And really, the objective that we want here is to try and do most of the process, trying to access most of the data in these low cost uh, levels of the memory hierarchy. Of course, the challenge is that the amount of storage that you have down here is very small. Right? Well, again, we're talking about 1K byte per processing element. So how do we do that when like, the neural net is really, really large? Um, so again, in this space, there's been a huge amount of activity. So before really delving into you know, what is the best possible solution, it's always important to kind of take a look at you know, what are the solutions that people have taken out there. Uh, so as part of this work, uh, we really looked at trying to categorize the different types of data flows that are out there in this uh, deep neural network hardware space. Uh, so the first very popular approach of doing um, neural network processing on a spatial architecture would be what we call this weight stationary data flow. And the main idea here is that you want to minimize the energy consumption of reading the weights. Okay? So what you, this is basically what it means is that I want to store at each processing element, I'm going to use that 1K byte, 1K byte memory to store my weight information. 
Okay, and so whenever I read the weights, it's going to be super cheap because of this, you know, weight memory is very low. Um, the trade-off, of course, is that the weights might be stationary at each processing element, but the pixel information and the partial sums now have to move through the network and come from the global buffer, right? So that's the trade-off. You know, there's no free lunch, and you can find examples of this type of data flow in the designs shown here below. Um, another approach that people have taken is what we call output stationary. And the train of thought for this goes like this. So the idea is that, you know, weights is one thing, but partial sums, I actually have to read and write the partial sums. I have to always update it. So there's two memory accesses per partial sum when I'm doing an update. Um, so I'd like to keep the partial sums, in fact, in this low cost memory instead, not the weights. And so I basically what we're saying is that for at each of the processing elements, I'm trying to, as much as possible, compute the entire output, do all of the accumulations locally. So all the reads and write of that partial sums are coming from that very small uh, memory. Again, the trade-off is going to be that the pixel information and the weight information now have to flow through your network and through your global buffer, which is going to be more expensive. And some examples of designs that use this type of data flow are shown here below. Um, and then finally, there's the approach called no local reuse. Um, and the idea for this is that, um, you know, if you're a memory designer, you know that the issue with having small memories um, is that the area per bit ratio is it's very area inefficient because the, you know, peripheral costs, for example, are not going to be amortized across a lot of bit cells, right? So it's a very area inefficient way of storing data. So if you have a fixed area, what might be what you would not want to do is say, okay, forget about these small local memories at the processing element. Instead, let me aggregate all that area and make a very large global buffer. And as a result, for the same net area of the whole system, I'm storing more bits. So my storage capacity-wise is much higher, and this is great because basically I can avoid going to DRAM as often as I needed to before, and we know that DRAM is very expensive. Right? So this is a strategy that's taken by um, these various other papers that are listed below. Um, so in our group, we looked at another approach, uh, looking at what we call row stationary. Um, and really, the objective here is what you'll see is we really want to kind of balance you know, minimizing data movement of all data types, as well as both the DRAM and on-chip uh, power. So, oh yeah, so I should mention, for the no local reuse, of course, the trade-off is that you get much more traffic on-chip. Even though going on and off-chip, it's much less, but on-chip, you have a lot of data movement. Um, so to explain the rotation stationary data flow, I'm going to use an example. So again, I'm going to start by a 3x3 three three filter and a 5x5 five five input image, and I'm generating a 3x3 three three output. And basically what this involves is I'm going to, for every PE, I'm going to process one row of data. That's what we call it row stationary. Um, so I have a given PE. I can load a row of the filter um, and then you know a subset or a window of a row of the input image. I do... Uh, you know, basically a uh, multiplication of each of these components and add them together, and I generate a partial sum, and this partial sum will be fed into the register file. Um, so again, all these reads are now, they read once into the PE, and then they're all going to, all the subsequent reads and writes are going to come from this register file. And then for the next partial sum, basically all I have to do is slide or update, you see up here, you can update the um, input image. The filters don't have to move, so I just read one additional, um, you know, pixel, for example, or activation externally to the PE, so that you know, might be the expensive part, but then all the reads for the filter and the other um, input pixels uh, come from the register file within the PE, as well as the partial sum itself is also being updated within the PE, and only one value is pushed out. And then I repeat this again. Um, so the main idea is that within the PE itself, I'm maximizing row convolutional reuse in the register file for both the uh, filter as well as the image by doing this kind of sliding window effect. Um, and I'm also maximizing the row partial sum accumulation. So all the additions and reads and writes for the partial sum for that one row happen within the processing element itself. And again, the idea is that if I can do all my reads and writes from the PE, that's much cheaper than fetching the data externally outside of the PE. Um, so, of course, this is just, you know, a 1D convolution. How could I potentially extend it to 2D? Um, okay, so I'll just basically walk through this example. So if we just have this 1D PE here, we're doing 1D uh, row convolution, I could also stack multiple of these PEs on top of each other. And this basically allows us to basically complete a 2D convolution as shown here below, right? So for each of these PEs, they represent one row of the filter. Um, and then also one row of the input image. 
And then we would add all of those values together. In this case, we would add vertically between the PEs. So we're moving the partial sums vertically between the PEs, and we would generate one complete row at the output. Okay? For the next you know, set of rows of PEs, we can gen or the next row of the output, we can repeat this column, but now rather than looking at rows one, two, and three, we look at rows two, three, and four as shown down here. And again, we repeat this kind of one by uh, one D row convolution, and then we accumulate vertically through the array to compute row of two. And then we repeat this again, now looking at rows three, four, and five as an input. And then we want to accumulate vertically for the partial sum and generate the output. The reason why we want to accumulate vertically in terms of the partial sum is that we want to avoid going to the expensive global buffer memory, for example. Um, and another advantage that you can see here is that horizontally, if you look at the green filters, the rows, the row filter weights will repeat horizontally across the array. So I, what this means is I read once from that expensive global buffer, and then I can utilize it horizontally across my array. You can repeat that for row two and row three. And then for uh, the input feature map, I also read once from the global buffer, and then I, you can use it diagonally across the array. So you can see like rows two, two here, and then row three, three, and so on um, in the blue. And the main idea when you put this all together is that we're really trying to optimize the efficiency for all the different data types as opposed to one particular data type itself. So we're looking at the aggregate cost of the data movement for all these data types and not just one particular data type. So what is the, so that was a little, um, you know, it's a lot of stuff here. So if you want to get more details, I would suggest going to the actual ISCA paper itself and kind of walk through the various dimensions. There's also a higher dimensional version of this looking at, because this is just a 2D convolution. Of course, we talked about there's, you know, the channel components and the number of filters. And so that paper will talk more about how you map all of those things on top of this. Um, but the main idea here is that if I want to compare all these different data flows, for example, I have the weight stationary case where I'm trying to really minimize the movement of the filter weights, the output stationary where I'm trying to minimize the movement of the partial sums, um, there's the no local reuse approach where, again, I don't want to have any local storage in my PEs. Um, I want to maximize the global buffer size to reduce DRAM energy, and then we have row stationary. So I want to compare all these different approaches. Um, and the way that you can compare them is, for example, you can, let's say that we can fix the area size. So it's always important to fix the area size, so it's a fair comparison. Uh, let's say we evaluate it with AlexNet uh, with 256 PEs for all these designs, and we're going to assume a batch size of 16. And then the energy model that we're going to use is based on that kind of uh, the energy of the memory hierarchy, as we saw before. Um, so what's the impact of this? So if we look at the convolutional layers, we can see that, so here's the weight stationary. These are the three variants of the output stationary. There's a no local reuse and a row stationary. So the first thing I just want to point out is that you'll notice that the ALU power, so the power to consume or the energy consumed doing the multiply and accumulate in the dark blue is the same across all the data flows. And that's to be expected, right? We're doing the same amount of computation for all of these. The main difference is just how am I getting the data to the multiply and accumulate engine, OK? Um, you'll also notice that the no local reuse by design, because there's no uh, local buffer, so you can store a lot of stuff on chip, is that the DRAM energy there is very low. And that's by design. But as a result, both the buffer energy and the knock energy is very high, because there's a lot of data movement. An overall summary of this is that the row stationary uses about 1.4 to 2.5x lower energy than the other data flows. Another way to get some intuition as to why this row stationary is doing better is if we cut the data in terms of what is the energy spent per different types of data moving around the system. Right? So for example, in weight stationary, uh, if you remember, we're keeping the weight local within the PE. And so you can see that the green portion of the energy is the lowest. And that's by design. We're not trying to move the weights very much through the system. right? Um, but as a result, the partial sum energy and the pixel energy is quite high. If we look at the different variants of output stationary, we can see that the partial sum energy is very low. And that's, again, by design, is lower than the other approaches. But we can see that the weight energy and the pixel energy is much higher. right? And then, so you can see in row stationary, it really looks at balancing you know, the energy consumption of all the different data types. So overall, you get a much more uh, reduced energy. So if I could say one very high level message, you know, row stationary is one particular approach, but the high level message to all of this is that you want to not just minimize the energy of one particular data type, you want to minimize the overall energy. And then looking at the no local reuse case, you don't want to just minimize the energy of the DRAM or of the chip.
but jointly both the DRAM and the chip, or overall system energy. It's good not to focus always on just one particular metric. Um, and that's kind of the theme of all of this. You should always look holistically at the whole problem. Um, as an example of a piece of hardware that supports the row stationary, we built this um, Iris Deep CNN accelerator that we presented at ISSCC back in 2016. Uh, it basically has, you can see, a PE array of 14 by 12, so 168 processing elements. Um, and each of these processing elements have about 1K byte of memory. They all communicate to about 100K bytes of global buffer memory, SRAM. Um, and then we go off chip. Um, to the DRAM. We have some compression, decompression here that I'll talk about um, in a bit. Um, but that's basically the memory hierarchy that we saw before. Uh, here's a photo of the uh, chip itself, so die photo. We fabricated in TSMC 65 nanometer LP process. Um, okay, so we already walked through all these specs. And really one of the fundamental things that um, you know, I found to be the most exciting about this chip is that it's also very flexible, right? So at the time you could support a wide range of uh, filters in terms of width and heights, number of filters, number of channels, and also different strides. And as I mentioned, this is really important because first of all, within a neural network itself, the filter shapes will vary from layer to layer. And then also we know that there's many more um, filter or neural networks now. So you need to really build in that flexibility in your system. To get an idea in terms of the impact of a lot of the uh, reuse that we had, so for example, if we wanted to do four images of Alex, uh, with AlexNet, uh, process four images with AlexNet, you need about 2.6 billion multiplies and accumulates. So if you just kind of think through how much data you need to drive you know, 2.6 billion multiplies and accumulates, assuming these are 16-bit inputs and outputs, you're talking about 16 gigabytes of input and 5.4 gigabytes of output. Um, but however, since we're really kind of exploiting as much data reuse as possible locally within each of these processing elements within the register file and also sharing data between the processing elements, you only need about 208 megabytes of memory access from the global buffer and then only 15 megabytes, 15.4 megabytes of access from the DRAM. So again, I really just want to emphasize the importance of if you can really exploit a lot of this data reuse, you can really reduce the on and off chip transactions and also the memory access or transactions from the other more expensive levels of the memory hierarchy. Um, at a very, you know, just very briefly, at, at that time we compared, this is from 2016, so we compared it um, to the NVIDIA TK1, uh, which is uh, at the time NVIDIA's um, state-of-the-art mobile GPU. Of course, now they have all the way up to TX2 now, but this is kind of a snapshot of 2016. Um, and you can see that Iris is an older process technology than TK1. It has fewer number of multipliers, um, comparable storage. Iris is in 16-bit bit fixed, while TK, um, TK1 is in 32-bit uh, float. Um, so the throughput of Iris is about half of the NVIDIA TK1. Um, but the measured power is about 20x in terms of difference. So very roughly speaking, you could say at the time it was about 10x more energy efficient than the existing embedded mobile processors out there. And also because of a lot of the data reuse, uh, we got a lot of DRAM uh, bandwidth reduction, as we mentioned. Um, so taking a step back, um, one thing to really kind of think about is the fact that um, in all of these cases, we're just doing what we would call an image classification task or an image uh, object detection class. And really it it revolves about this concept of machine learning. Basically what we're doing is, for example, if you take in an image and you try and recognize what's in the image, your you know, input's an image, your output is a set of scores of you know, which class of image it actually belongs in. And you can actually break up this pipeline into two steps. Um, you can think of it as the feature extraction component. Um, and I, we kind of hinted towards this at the beginning. So historically, the way people used to do this type of processing um, it would be you'd have an expert come in and say, hey, look at this image. These edges are really important, and these are the features I want to extract. Um, but now with deep learning, you actually learn what those features that you should be extracting are directly from the data itself, and then you can extract richer features. And at the end of the day, all you also actually also what you're doing is basically um, a classification task, which is just a matrix multiplication. And so really, you could think of it as the core difference between traditional computer vision or you know, handcrafted designs uh, versus deep learning is the fact that the features are now learned as opposed to handcrafted. Um, 
And we've shown in the past within our own research that if you use this you know, more older approach, which actually you know, was closer to state of the art in 2011, so it's not that long ago, but you know, this field moves very quickly, um, you actually could design um, systems that use you know, this handcrafted feature approach to really get really energy efficient processing to the extent that you could be as energy efficient as video compression. And the reason why that's a good benchmark to use is that you can imagine every image sensor out there, if you're going to store or transmit that data, you're going to have to have some form of image or video compression at the back end of that image sensor. So that's a good kind of benchmark in terms of what is the cost that you know, today we're willing to pay for processing near the sensor. And so the question is, could we achieve that you know, with the same cost limitation, could we actually, rather than compressing the pixels, understand the pixels? And in this work that was published at VLSI, that's what we were trying to answer. And so using more of these handcrafted features like HOG um, and looking at deformable parts models, you can make the energy similar. But when you compare this to the deep learning space, right, which is what we're all excited about because it's increasing energy, I mean, inc increasing accuracy, the energy also greatly increases. So again, taking a step back and looking at the trade-off between energy and accuracy, we can see that while accuracy linearly increases, um, energy exponentially increases. So for example, looking at that hog-based approach that we saw on the previous slide, um, when we compare that to AlexNet, and this is using the same, these are measured results using the same process technology, um, these are both designs done by two students within my group. They started their PhD at the same time and they're gonna graduate you know, in a month at the same time. So it's like as, as much of a controlled experiment as we could do. Um, but you can see that with these measured results, uh, with the same process technology, and they really both optimize the hardware um, really well, you can see that AlexNet consumes 300 times more energy per pixel than HOG. And then if you go to VGG, Sure, you get more accuracy, but you're talking about 10,000 times higher energy per pixel than HOG. So one of the questions that you should ask is that, am I willing for you know, some linear increase, well, maybe going from, let's say, 35, you know, average precision is a measure of accuracy for object detection, to maybe 60 for Alex, am I willing to pay that 300x in terms of energy? So for example, would I be willing for my phone to die 300x faster for that amount of accuracy, right? So that's really something that, Realistic that we, realistically that we should think about. The challenge, and then of course, VGG is even worse. That's 10,000 times faster if you're willing to make that trade off. And I think really the challenge in this whole space, at least from a research perspective as well, has been that you have a lot of algorithm designers really focusing on the accuracy line, and then you have maybe hardware and circuit designers focusing more on the energy line, but not kind of looking at both and looking at the trade offs. Right? So it's really important to overall like, take a step back and try and make sure that you're getting favorable trade-offs in your designs. Um, so there are some, in order to, what we really want to do here is we actually want to try and close this gap. Right? Can we maintain the same accuracy but bring the energy costs down because we don't want our phones to die so quickly? Um, so there are some opportunities in both the joint algorithm hardware design. So looking at both at the same time. And can we kind of really um, bring the energy consumption down there? Um, so I won't be able to go through everything, but at the very high level, there's you know, kind of two categories of approaches that are used in this particular case. And this is really the idea here is how do I design um, the neural al network algorithm to make them more friendly towards the hardware? And some of these cases, you actually have to change the hardware for you to be able to get the energy or throughput gains. So one is that you want to reduce the number of operands or the storage uh, reduce the size of the operands on the storage or compute, right? So for example, you might go from floating point to fixed point, reduce bit width or use nonlinear quantization. We'll talk about that. Or another approach that people take, or and, I shouldn't say or, but they could also do, uh, reduce the number of operations for storage and compute. So this involves things like compression, exploiting uh, sparsity, pruning, trying to remove certain uh, pieces of the network that might not be so useful, and actually maybe trying to redesign the network architecture itself. So change the filter shapes to make them more um, efficient in terms of reducing the number of operations and storage costs. So we'll I'll walk through some of these examples. Um, so the first thing, you know, right off the bat, you know, the, the thing that people spent a lot of time exploring, I think up until 2016, even see people are some, doing some stuff now, is that looking at the bit width. What is the bit width requirement? And in 2016, um, 
basically both NVIDIA and Google, with Google CPU, came up with products that are basically supporting 8-bit integer for the inference side of things. Training is a different story, but for inference, they show that you know, in their, from their perspective, 8-bit seems to be enough. So I think you can understand from a commercial standpoint, that's pretty widely accepted now, 8-bit integer for inference. Um, from the research side of things, people continue to try and push the bit widths. Um, so, in fact, you've been, you know, there's been a variety of different works. So there's been a lot of focus on reducing bits uh, all the way down to binary, right? So for example, looking at making the number of bits in the weights to be one. So basically a weight can only be one or zero. And so you get a set of these binary filters as opposed to like very rich filters. Um, the trade-off here is that there's a significant accuracy drop. Right, so again, this is something to keep in mind because the reason why people are so excited about this space is in particular the accuracy that people are achieving with these techniques. Um, another approach that people have been looking at is actually reducing the number of unique weights. Right, so rather than having you know, a network that can take on any weights, I'm gonna reduce the total number of unique weights. And then basically, then all I have to store is an index for that weight. So if I only have to store, you know, eight types of weights, then I only need to store a three-bit value to represent zero to seven. And I can just say which of the weights I actually want to use, right? So there's some work in terms of both ternary weights um, and also XNOR nets, which look at you know, reducing the number of weights as well as the number of activations. Um, and then finally, there's been some work looking at nonlinear quantization. And the, one, the thing that motivates this is that if you look at the distribution or histogram of the weights themselves, um, they tend to look something like this. And so if, you, so if you do linear quantization, you might, might not be equally kind of spread, you, you know, spreading out your boundaries or putting your boundaries where they best belong. Um, if you actually use, let's say, a log quantization, in particular log two, um, then you can actually put more boundaries where there's actually more data. And if you think back to you know, the courses you might have taken related to quantization, this is a much more desirable effect in terms of minimizing the error. And the benefit of using log two, of course, is that then a lot of your computations can be just reduced to shifts. Right, when you do, instead of doing a multiply, you can just do a shift if all your weights are powers of two. Um, and so in order to exploit this, the people have also built specialized hardware. Um, in particular, in dealing with the case that actually sometimes the number of bits per layer for either the weights or the activations can vary. You might not constantly have the same number of minimum bits. Right, so there's been some work out of, for instance, University of Toronto um, using uh, some work called Stripes, basically looking at what we would call bit serial processing. So they process one bit at a time. And then the idea here is that, you know, if I have fewer bits, then I can run faster because I spend fewer cycles, right? Um, an alternative work um, came out of KU Leuven's group. And there, rather than looking at running faster for smaller bit width, what they actually want to do is we want to trade that off for energy savings. So what they do is they exploit voltage scaling the idea here is that if I do fewer bits, the critical path of my multiplier will be shorter, right? And so then I can dial down the voltage and that will you know, increase the delay and gradually expand back to like the original budget of the delay and I can operate at a lower voltage. And the idea here is that if you remember um, in terms of you know, power is or power is proportional to switching activity times capacitance and frequency and voltage square, you get a quadratic savings in terms of um, power when you do voltage scaling. Um, and then so finally, also I should mention, in terms of the binary weights itself, um, you know, despite the fact that they have some accuracy issues, people have also been exploring to see whether or not they can build hardware to support that. Um, so there's also been a bunch of recent work related to this. Um, the most recently, for example, what's shown here is uh, some brain work that was published at VLSI back in 2017, looking at really kind of um, doing the processing very much near the memory. Um, in this particular case, near the SRAM, so near, very close by, they're doing some XNOR computation um, in this particular design. Um, you might have heard of True North from IBM, which is a more spiking-based approach, but they can also reconfigure it to actually support ternary weights, which is basically the concept of ternary weights is that I have plus and minus weight and a zero weight. So I have three different types of weight and binary activations. Um, most of these designs that exist out there as of right now that look at binary nets, they tend not to uh, basically uh, support the state-of-the-art uh, DNN models. Um, they're typically quite limited to more networks like LUNET that are doing digit classification, uh, with the exception of Yoda NN. Um, so that's dealing with bit width. There's also a lot of work dealing with sparsity. So there's two types of sparsity that you can consider. Um, one is the sparsity that naturally occurs within the feature map itself, right? So for example, um, 
If I have, you know, after a convolution, I generate a feature map that looks like this, typically what I have to do is I have to pass it through some sort of nonlinearity. And a very popular form of nonlinearity for especially convolutional nets is this rectified linear unit, or they call it ReLU for short. And basically all it does, it's again very simple, it's a fancy name for a simple thing, which is I set all negative values to zero. That's it. And then everything else gets passed through. <clears throat> And so as a result, the resulting feature map after you do this nonlinearity or after you pass it through the activation is a bunch of zeros. Um, and so shown here below is kind of a plot that shows you the uh, number of activations in blue and the number of non-zero uh, activations in red. And what you can see is as you go deeper into the network, uh, the percentage of non-zero activations really reduces. Right? So if you can really reduce the amount of computation or exploit the fact that the only the number of non-zero operations you have is much smaller than the true activations, maybe you can get some savings here. <clears throat> so there's two ways, or a couple ways you can do this. Um, one way is actually you can skip the operation itself. So anything times zero is going to be zero, right? So basically you can avoid reading from the memory for the other operand. You can also avoid doing the actual multiply itself. Um, and in the IRIS work, we found that this gives you about a 45% energy savings just by avoiding reading from the memory and reading for uh, doing the computation when the one of the when the weight or sorry in this particular case when the activation is zero. Another thing that you can do is again you can apply compression actually right so you don't want to keep on sending all of these zeros you can use simple things like run length coding to minimize the amount of data that you're actually sending. And so again, you can see uh, shown here in, in the blue is if you had it uncompressed and then if you actually perform some very simple run length coding on these feature maps with a bunch of zeros, you can reduce the amount of data that you're sending to the DRAM. And again, that's really important because DRAM's energy is very expensive at the more you access it. Uh, another way, oh, so I don't have the exact full size, but the other ways you can actually do this is you can also you know, skip the operation itself, right? And so, in these particular cases, we're just skipping the operation, but we're, we're not saving the cycle. But you could actually skip the operation itself, and you can speed things up. And there's some work uh, from University of Toronto called Convolutin that does that, and then you get additional speeds up, speed up in terms, of, in terms of performance or throughput. So that's making the activations. Activations are naturally sparse, uh, but you can also force the weights of the neural network to be sparse as well. Um, and this idea is not new. So this work was done, this concept was explored by Jan LeCun back in the 80s uh, through a process called optimal brain damage, which is appropriately named because at the time they're thinking about how, you know, neural nets. So how can you optimally damage this neural net by removing weights? Um, and then the real message that he had in his paper was that you do have to do some retraining. So after you remove these weights, it's important to fine tune the value of the weights to kind of account for the fact that, for example, your neighbors are now gone. And by doing that, in this case, he showed that you know, in this plot, towards the left-hand side, you're reducing the number of parameters. And then in the um, y-axis, you're showing the error. So the lower, the better. So you're showing that with retraining, if you update the values of your weights, you can have lower parameters without increasing the error. Um, and as with every good thing, these types of things are rediscovered. So in 2015, uh, the concept of pruning deep learning was, the first, again, first demonstrated um, all, by basically removing weights based on the magnitude of the weights. Right? And this was done, again, in, at NITS 2014, uh, or 15 from some work at Stanford. And the idea is that you, know, you take a large neural network. Again, you're removing some of the weights, particularly the weights that are um, very small. Um, and then you can, you know, for example, looking at AlexNet, you can reduce the number of weights uh, for convolutional layers by 2.7x, and then for fully connected layers by 9.9x, right? And so you get an overall 9x weight reduction because most of the weights typically reside in the fully connected layer, uh, and about a 3x reduction in terms of total number of operations. Um, but one thing, key thing that you might want to observe in this, you know, entire work is that often the number of weights alone are not necessarily a good metric for energy, right? In fact, once again, as you saw before, it's really important to take all data types into account. So if we look, example, at the breakdown of the energy of Googlenet, we could see that only 22% of the energy is actually for the weight movement, but you also have, you know, input and output feature map movement as well, and those also contribute significantly to the energy um, of the system. Um, it's not easy to figure out what the energy breakdowns are of neural networks, for example. Um, so one way that you can do this is use an energy evaluation tool. So in my group, we developed this energy evaluation methodology where you can take um, different CNN shapes, so based on the height and width of the filters of the whole number of channels, as well as what the weights are and the inputs are, so you can factor in sparsity. And basically, it'll give you a breakdown in terms of 
the amount of energy that you're spending at different levels of the memory hierarchy, as well as the energy for the computation. And so finally, you get a breakdown in terms of the energy per layer. And so why is this useful? Well, if we're saying that the number of weights themselves alone are not a good metric for energy, then what we want to do is figure out where is the energy actually going and apply pruning there. Right? So you actually want to directly remove the stuff that's consuming the most energy. And what this energy evaluation methodology does is it'll allow you to kind of dissect and figure out where the energy is actually going. Um, and so first of all, we tried to lo look at you know, some trends using this energy evaluation methodology um, of the different neural nets that are out there. Right? So for example, in this particular plot, we have energy on the horizontal axis and accuracy on the vertical axis. Um, and we can see a very important trend that basically deeper CNNs with fewer weights, so for example, SqueezeNet or GoogleNet, don't necessarily consume less energy than CNNs with sh uh, shallower CNNs with more weights, for example, AlexNet. Um, and when you apply, for example, this magnitude-based uh, weight pruning approach where you're trying to remove the weights that are small, um, you do get some savings in terms of energy. So again, in this particular plot, up and to the left is better. Um, and so you can see, so AlexNet gets some substantial reduction in terms of energy without losing any accuracy. And SqueezeNet actually does gain a little bit of accuracy um, and has lower energy. But what we found is that if you really kind of factor in energy, if you're directly, rather than targeting, reducing, or removing weights that are small, but actually what I want to do is remove the weights that consume the most energy. So basically what we do is we sort um, the layers in terms of which ones consume the most energy and prune the high energy layers first, because as you remove more and more weights, it becomes very difficult to maintain your accuracy. So basically you want to spend your efforts where most of the energy is occurring. You actually see in the red points here that you get a better energy versus accuracy trade-off. Um, and so in fact, if we look, for example, at AlexNet, you get about a 3.7x reduction compared to not pruning it. And then compared to you know, even pruning it with magnitude-based pruning, you get about 1.74x uh, reduction in energy. Um, so my main message is not necessarily that energy-aware pruning is the best thing. My, actually, what I want, the message I want to get across is that if you care about energy, right, or if you care about latency, which we'll talk about next, you just should design your network for that, as opposed to designing it for reduced number of weights or reduced number of max. So those might not necessarily map to the metrics that you actually care about. Okay, so you want to really factor in these real, direct, or true metrics into the design. Um, and this is some work that we did recently with uh, Google as well. So kind of extending from the energy-aware pruning work that we just did, uh, we looked at, you know, what if I couldn't develop an energy model for the platform? Because that could be a lot of effort. So we developed our energy model based on Iris. Uh, but what if you didn't have access to an energy model? Um, could you actually take measurements directly from a platform that you might have and then feed that in to an optimization so that you can tailor or adapt your, uh, your DNN specifically to you know, minimize, in, th in this particular case, minimize the latency. But you could also do this for energy for a given platform. Right? And really, the, the key message that I want to get across with this work is that you have this algorithm, NetAdapt, that you're taking some pre-trained network in, and then you're feeding in some empirical measurements that you're getting from the platform itself. So you know, let's say different phones or different watches and so on. Um, and that gives you basically a latency or energy breakdown for the different layers or different um, forms of you know, number of filters. And that can feed into the optimization algorithm, NetAdapt. And then you get an adapted layer that comes out. That's basically will really minimize, in this particular case, the latency of running that neural net on this particular platform. So it's directly the metric that you care about. Uh, one thing that was really important for this work is to have this process to be automated, because of course, you don't want to have to hand tune every neural network for every different platform. Right? You want to kind of completely automate this whole process. And the benefits of looking at empirical measurements is that you avoid having to deal with the nonlinearities that occur with you know, the tool chain or the details of the platform architecture itself, which can often be proprietary. Um, just to show what the impact of this is, if I look at latency versus accuracy, um, again here, upper to the left is better. So shown in the red is um, basically the result with NetAdapt, which is the approach that we took, applied to MobileNet. Um, MobileNet is a very compact network architecture that's been designed for Google specifically for running on mobile devices. And so shown here in the um, green triangles is the MobileNet family itself. Um, and then MorphNet is another version of kind of really trying to tweak these neural nets um, 
to make them more efficient, but you can see that you know, using these direct metrics, for example, in this particular case, latency, and feeding into an optimization network that's trying to find the best network for this platform gives you up to about 1.7x reduction um, in terms of latency. So this is your real measured inference speed uh, at a higher accuracy. Right? So the main, again, the main message I just want to like kind of get across is that if you care about latency, if you care about energy, you should be factoring those metrics into your design, not necessarily like the number of weights or number of max, even though that's much easier to compute, but that might not lead you to the right direction. Right? The network you might get at the end might not be as um, exciting or promising as you might have thought. Um, if you're talking about sparse architectures in general, um, typically, um, as some of you might have found, they don't necessarily run so well on today's CPUs or GPUs. And typically, you do have to design some specialized hardware to exploit the sparsity in these networks. And so there have been a variety of processors, both EIE and SCNN, that have been looking to support you know, uh, sparse fully connected layers and then sparse convolutional layers in a variety of different ways. So if you're interested in this, I would encourage you to take a look at these papers as well. Um, one of the challenges is to find a solution that actually can support different types of layers and the sparsity as well, and both efficiently. Um, and then finally, I just want to mention, again, another approach that people have taken in terms of making uh, neural networks more hardware friendly, um, at least in the concept of trying to reduce the number of weights and ops. And this is really coming up with new compact network architecture designs. Right? So for example, um, one idea is to build the networks with a series of smaller filters than one big filter. So if you have a five by five filter in Inception v3 from Google, they exploit basically breaking it down into two separable filters. So rather than using a five by five, you have a five by one and a one by five, and you can apply these serial Serially. And these, okay, so this concept of using separability for processing is actually, again, a very old concept. So when I teach my image processing class, we teach this in like the first two weeks, right? So the idea of separation and just breaking it down. Um, but it's always, you know, nice to see these techniques rediscovered for these new applications. Um, and then you also have VGG, which does a similar thing. It takes these five by five filters and breaks it down to two three by threes. Um, another approach, which we don't have time, too much time to get into, is the concept of bottleneck. And really, the main idea here is that, if you remember, there's this third dimension called the channels in the filter itself. And the idea is that, in order to reduce the number of operations, what people want to do is they apply this, what they call a bottleneck, a one-by-one one bottleneck. And before they actually do a big you know, convolution, they want to reduce the number of channels Okay, so I'll use Google as an example. You want to reduce the number of channels with these bottlenecks, these one by one convolutions that reduce the number of channels, then do the three by three or five by five convolution, and then concatenate together. So you have these bottlenecks that basically shrink the number of channels that you need to support. And then sometimes in things like ResNet, they first you know, compress or reduce the number of channels, apply the filter, and then they expand it again. Right? And the really idea is that when they're doing the, the larger computation, they're trying to reduce the total number of channels that you have to support. And then SqueezeNet is something that really takes us to the extreme. Um, so this is a lot of information in a very short period of time. So if you want to walk through it more slowly, um, actually our group has spent a lot of time over the past uh, two, two years uh, putting together tutorials on this. We had, so we had a day-long tutorial at various computer architecture conferences. So we have slides for those tutorials that are up. So if you're interested in that, I suggest you take a look at that. That's like a full day, eight hours worth of this stuff. Um, and if you want to read through it. Basically, what I would consider kind of like a script of that tutorial would be this proceedings paper that we wrote uh, last year, which is like 30 pages, but it basically walks through all these key concepts. And really, again, the goal of all of this work is really to kind of organize um, all the research that's been going on out there. So as you know, this field moves very quickly. So there's a couple, probably lots of new developments that have happened since you know, basically December of 2017, even though we're only here in April. Um, but I'm just hoping that, you know, the goal for our team was to give you guys a set of resources so that, you know, you can kind of build a foundation upon which you can just read these other uh, new developments in this area. Um, and then one final thing that I just want to really emphasize that I noticed, or we, as a team we noticed when we were doing all of this kind of overview material, is that really, as you know, there's more and more techniques to make neural networks more efficient, one of the key challenges is that it's resulting in a much more diverse set of DNNs. So it's really important when we're trying to assess hardware that we have a more comprehensive set of benchmarks. So not just you know, measuring the hardware for AlexNet or uh, in the worst case, like just Linnet. You might want to be able to you know, support, or not just looking at only you know, supporting sparse networks on a sparse hardware, but can you support also sparse and dense 
um, neural nets, or can you support both large and compact network architectures? So having um, that flexibility is really important. Um, in terms of bit width, so we've seen that at least from the academic point of view, and I think also in industry, there has been more work in flexible bit width. So that part I don't think is as much of an issue as these other components that still remain. Um, also, again, in our group, we've been recently trying to figure out a more systematic way by which you can kind of really analyze and understand the inefficiencies of DNN architectures. Um, so this is some work that should be on archive soon. So it's not there right now, but you can take a look in a couple of weeks. Um, and we call it iExam because it's um, you know, inspired by IRIS. But the main idea here is that there's many design decisions that you make while you're doing an architecture design, um, ranging from things like what is the workload, um, so that would be more, you know, what is the neural network itself and the data flow that we might select, um, as well as the number of processing elements. What is the actual size of the array that you're going to put these processing elements in? So if I have 12 processing elements, just as an example, would it be 3 by 4 or 2 by 6 or you know, one by 12, you know, how would you actually organize it? And what would that be, impact be on your performance itself? Um, you know, how much storage you might have? Um, how much bandwidth you have internally on that knock, right? And how, you know, what is the dynamic utilization of that knock? And really the reason why I'm trying to show this graph is that often, um, or unfortunately, people primarily like to report their theoretical peak performance, which is shown here. And you can see that there's many, many other factors that come into play to reduce peak performance, right? So showing peak performance is an insufficient benchmark in terms of evaluating the quality of the hardware, okay? So you should always, if you guys are looking at hardware, whether it be a paper or, you know, for product stuff, you should ask, I don't want to know just about peak, I want to know, like, you know, all these other factors because the utilization also matters. Um, and then, you know, this is basically, if you're familiar with the roofline model, um, that's typically widely used in uh, computer architecture, this is going to be thought of as basically tightening the roofline model. Um, so very briefly, there's also other opportunities in terms of memories and devices that have been explored. This is more on the circuit side of things. So we talked a lot about architectures, but on the circuit side of things and devices, people have done a lot of interesting work. Um, one is looking at using stacked DRAM. So if you can, you know, one of the issues we talked about was data movement's very expensive. So if I can stack the DRAM on top of the uh, computation itself, I'm really trying to bring the memory closer. So the cost of accessing DRAM will be lower and I also get higher bandwidth. So there's some, been some interesting work on that from, uh, from Stanford uh, in terms of Tetris, um, as well as NeuroCube from Georgia Tech. There's also been some work in looking at using embedded DRAM itself. So can I you know, take this EDRAM technology, put it on chip, and then use that to store these very large neural nets? Um, that's somewhere from, uh, called Dadia now. Um, that was from Micro 2014. And then finally, there's been a lot of work on these like, new emerging devices looking at non-volatile memories. And the main idea here is that they want to treat these memories. Um, the, it's basically, what they have is it's much, a bunch of resistors. And the conductance of these resistors can basically act as the weight. Um, and then you apply a voltage, which is basically your input activation, your pixels, to one side. And then the current that passes through these resistors all the way through, you can add them up through KCL. And so there you have your multiply and accumulate. Right? So this is a fundamental, you know, a lot of this non-volatile memory that you see people doing like in-memory processing is based on this concept. Um, if you looked at all those data flows that we talked about before, this would be the weight stationary data flow. And there's been a lot of work in this space from the architecture community, there's some shown here, but also even in the device community, people are trying to build these type of architectures. And the heart of it, this is the type of processing that they're doing. Um, in terms of your memory person, um, from a circuits point of view, as opposed to device point of view, there's also been a lot of recent work in looking at building processing in the SRAM itself. Right, so um, this is some interesting work that uh, was published from uh, Princeton at VLSI 2016. And the idea here is that they will modulate the voltage of the word line. Um, and in the bit cell itself, you're going to store the weight. This is assuming binary weights. Okay, so in the bit cell, you store the weights. And then the uh, word line is the activation. So the voltage on the word line is the activation. And so um, the current that's going to come out of your bit cell through your bit line, so the discharge current is basically somewhat of a multiple of the storage in the cell, and value, value that's stored in the cell, as well as the word line voltage. And then again, you're using KCL to combine all this current together and sum it up. Um, so this was in 2016, and then um, if you attended ISSCC this year, there's a other wide range, they had a whole session on compute and memory. That's basically, again, 
built on top of these types of concepts, but looking at different things like rather than using the voltage on the word line, can I use a pulse width, width modulation on the word line instead? Or can I actually, rather than driving the word line, drive the bit line itself? And these are trying to do things like reduce you know, sensitivity to variation and increase um, energy efficiency. So if you're interested in that kind of perspective, it's important to look at that. OK, so for one final thing. So again, I just want to revisit this benchmark uh, concept in terms of comparing DNN. So if you only take this one thing away from this entire talk, I want you guys to take this away, okay? which is how to basically compare designs. Because there's so many designs out there, as I mentioned, we can't possibly cover them all in one talk or one paper because it continues to grow. So really what's really important is how do you evaluate the stuff that's coming out now, right? today, or tomorrow, and so on. Um, so again, it's really important to factor in all of these different metrics. We have accuracy. So what is the quality of result for a given task? This is very important because that's why people are so excited about deep learning. There's throughput, right? So if you're doing you know, high throughput analytics, this is important. If you need to do real time uh, you know, video 30 frames per second, this is really important. Latency is really important for interactive applications like autonomous navigation. Energy and power. Energy is really important for embedded devices. Power is really important in the data center. And then you have the hardware cost. Again, for each of these, you should dig deeper, right? So for accuracy, you should ask, what is the data set that you're using? What is the exact task? So an accuracy number itself is insufficient. For throughput, you want people to report the number of cores, but not just the peak performance, but also the utilization of those cores, right? So they should actually report to you, ideally, what is the runtime for a given set of DNN models. Like a very specific set, not just saying, oh, I have like, you know, a thousand multipliers, so it should be, you know, a thousand times whatever the clock rate is, that would be insufficient. For latency, you should really be asking, you know, what is the batch size? Because sometimes for very low latency applications, you can't afford um, batching. Some of them you can, some of them you can't. I mean, there's ways to get around it, but still you should ask. Um, energy and power, again, you want to get the power consumption of running a specific DNN model. Right, actually doing something. And also, you should really factor in external memory access. You should be looking at system power, okay? not just chip power, not just DRAM power. And then hardware cost, on-chip storage is important. I mean, how much do you actually have? You know, sometimes people can put a lot of storage on chip, but then you know, the cost of that chip is very high, so that's something to you know, factor in. Number of cores, chip area, process technology, all these things matter. So really try and ask a comprehensive set of metrics. Um, Okay, I'll just skip this. This is an example of how you would report this for Iris. Um, and the reason I want, like, just give you some case examples as to why you would actually want to make sure you have all metrics so you can have a fair evaluation. Because we know in engineering, everything is a trade-off. Okay, so you push one metric, something else pops. So you want to know what was the trade-off in this design. Often you might get a better trade-off, and that's good, but there's typically a trade-off. So a ex couple of examples of where if you omit some metric, something can happen. So for example, let's say you don't report the exact, the accuracy for a specific task, right? So you can just do it on a very, you could run a very simple DNN on a very easy task, and then you can claim it's very low power, very high throughput, very low cost. Um, however, the process actually might not, processor might not be useful for a meaningful task afterwards, right? So someone tries to use it on an actual big, you know, neural network task and it might not work. Another example is, um, what if I don't report off-chip bandwidth? Then I could build a processor that's only multipliers. Um, I can say it's very low cost, right? The area cost is very low. It's very high throughput, high accuracy, and has very low chip power, right? Because we know that data access is expensive, and if I only have multipliers, it's cheap. Um, however, when I look at the overall system power, the off-chip memory access will be substantial. OK, so like these are just two examples. So it's just something to keep in mind when you're assessing hardware. Again, because there's a wide range of uh, people working in this space, it's also important to evaluate if the results are measured or simulated. Um, those of you who have actually designed hardware know that there's a difference. Um, and then also on what data that's being tested. Um, and so you know, one example way by you might, where you might, how you might walk through uh, the different steps is you might start with accuracy, just to make sure you get enough accuracy for your task. Right? Then you want to see, oh, how fast can I actually go? Because it run fast enough for my task. Um, and then you know, what is the energy or power consumption? And that will primarily dictate you know, the form factor. Can I actually make it you know, portable? Or does it have to be plugged in, for example? Or do I need some cooling device on it? And then finally, you know, what is the cost? Right? That's going to be the final number that you put on it in terms of chip area um, and so on. Um, OK, so that's a lot of things. So just to summarize, again, deep learning is a very important area of research. 
You have a wide range of applications. And the key challenge is really balancing all those metrics that we just saw. Right? You have accuracy, energy, throughput, cost, and so on. And even with each, each of those, there's like a second layer of questions that you should be asking. Um, but there's a lot of also exciting opportunities to help address this type of uh, work. So there's various levels of innovation you can do in the hardware design. So the architecture, you can do joint algorithm hardware design, mixed signal design, and memory, and even advanced technologies and devices. Um, and then you have to, it's important to really inter understand the interactions between the different levels to really maximize your impact. Um, so we talked about a variety of different things um, today. So um, if you guys want to see some follow-up work for our group, you can also join the mailing list or um, the Twitter feed. Um, also, again, I want to refer you back to this paper in terms of an overview paper if you want to walk through the material slowly. Um, I'm also personally running, um, run it once or twice a year, you know, two-day professional education course on this particular topic. So if you're interested in that, the next offering's in July on MIT campus. Um, so um, if there's any interest to hear more of this, have two days of this, this is when you'd go there. Um, and then, of course, for any of this work, I think it's always really important to thank uh, the students. They're actually the ones who grind through a lot of this effort. Um, and of course, my sponsors in this research. So that concludes my talk. Thank you.